I'd like to welcome you to a lecture sponsored by the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. I'm Brinkley Messick. I'm a co-director of the center. This is a center that's been in existence for four years now, and it remains the only such center in the Western Hemisphere. Um, um, anyway, we're very happy to have a speaker today. I'm going to turn the, the controls here over to our colleague, uh, a fellow member of the a collective, faculty collective of the center, Brian Boyd, who is also director of the Center for Archaeology at Columbia University. Brian. Thank you, Brink. Thanks for coming, everyone. I was worried everyone was going to collect at the end of the table, but I'm glad to see you spreading out a bit now. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Linda Kikovitz uh, with her today. Uh, Linda's just finishing up a uh, postdoc uh, in Critical Global Humanities at Brown University. Um, she's a geographer, um, and she specializes in what she calls critical cartography. Uh, border politics and uh, social movements, political social movements, in a number of different geographical locations uh, in the US, um, in Mexico, uh, and her work there is particularly interested in the relationship between Israeli security and military uh, organizations and the Mexican government in the conflict with the Zapatistas. Um, her research on colonial cartography in Palestine focuses on the Palestinian production and use of uh, maps, both colonial and indigenous. Um, that was her dissertation research, which we're going to hear a little bit about today. And she's now taking this forward, as you'll hear, to analyze the internal use of cartography um, within the Palestinian movement itself. Um, <clears throat> she has a few publications that have just come out uh, in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, Special Issue. Uh, when the Carol Tree Was the Border, on Autonomy and Palestinian Practices of Figuring It Out. And uh, in 2010, a special issue of uh, Majal, uh, Law as Tactic, Palestine, the Zapatistas, and the Global Exercises of Power. Uh, her most recent is about to be published, Art of War, Art of Resistance, Palestinian Counter Cartography on Google Earth. And I've just read a draft of this, and it's fantastic. So uh, that's going to appear uh, shortly. Her title today is The Political Mapping of Palestine. Please welcome Linda Kikovitz. Thanks, Brian, and thanks to everyone for coming and um, being part of this. So I hope is a conversation. So I'll try not to spend too much time presenting, and so that way we can talk between, our, between each other and amongst ourselves. Sure. Um, what I'm going to present is kind of like the overarching uh, body of work from my doctoral research on um, Palestine. Um, the question that I sought to ask was very much a political question, one that um, wanted to investigate the shifts from when the Palestinian movement considered itself a liberation movement to when it considered itself an independence movement. So when it shifted from a politics of liberation to a politics of independence. And particularly looking at Oslo as, as that hinge moment. Um, and then seeing then what the consequences of that were for self-determination. In that in being a liberation movement, it very much understood itself as an anti-colonial movement. It was connected to many global networks all, of, you know, all over Asia, Latin America, Africa. Um, but then in the shift to independence, it started to see itself increasingly as exceptional in the world and lost many connections with, with, with other struggles worldwide. And internally, what that looked like was also a shift in the circulation of power away from people and toward uh, an elite ruling class. Uh, that was very technocratic, very bureaucratic. And so then I take the map as a lens to look at that shift. Um, and I begin with the life of the map in Palestine as it was introduced by colonialism in the 19th century, um, before Zionism, before the State of Israel was constructed. Uh, to then look at the logics that are still present in the maps that we use today when we think about 
and talk about the conflict because many of us that are very sympathetic to the Palestinian struggle continue using colonial frameworks without really knowing it and the movement itself does that as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is emphasize those frameworks and those logics a bit so that we can begin interrogating what we mean by a political realm that would allow for self-determination, right? And so then what I want to then do is look at how power is circulating uh, in different ways according to specific maps. And so this is what the presentation is going to be about. I hope it will become clearer as, as I go along, I hope. But do feel free to interrupt and ask me if I can clarify anything or if you'd like to object to anything, that would be great too and welcome. Uh, so what I'd like to do is begin by looking at how it is that our understanding of the Israel-Palestinian conflict uh, looks like in maps. And I'm just going to show a very, I think, what is standard uh, idea or framework. So just orienting ourselves, um, I'm imagining that in this room I don't really need to go into too much detail, um, but please do ask me to clarify and pause it if you do need, uh, if you have a question. So orienting ourselves to the Middle East and North Africa, this is a political map of the area and you notice the borders and uh, something that I'm always interested in in my work is looking at the history and the life of the border and what that does to how we think of politics. Uh, so here we have the Middle East and North Africa around 2000. And what I always like to point out is that these borders are fairly new. Uh, and they're fairly new all over the world. But they seem so natural now. And this is a question that I always want to ask. How is it that we, uh, that we start to understand the carving up of the world in this way as something that is natural and that cannot be changed? And maps do a really good job at naturalizing it because maps don't like to understand themselves as political. They're maps. You know, they are just showing the world as it is, and then we don't get the history of all of the political interests that went into creating that map. <clears throat> and even the conception of space, that the world actually should be cut up. So the Ottoman Empire, on the eve of, um, well, at around the moment when you start getting Europeans coming in to map Palestine geometrically, measuring it on the ground, this is what we're... This is how I'm defining a, a, the modern map of Palestine, uh, the very exact measurement on the ground, rather than a sketch, right? <clears throat> so what we have is, looking at the Ottoman Empire at around 1800, the conception of territory there was quite different from the conception of territory that we have now, um, where the conception of territory in the Ottoman Empire understood territory as those places that were important for trade, for example, including the seas. And it didn't have borders, it had frontiers. It had, and, and they would overlap with other empires and other places. It wasn't really important for the Ottoman Empire, like so many places in the world, to actually have a perfectly measured line. The <coughs> conception of space that we have today is that space should be homogenous, exclusive, bound, a chunk of space, and in there is where we're going to do politics. This is the, the state, uh, this is the space of the nation state. And so then borders become important. But borders were not important at this time. Just orienting ourselves to Palestine, Palestine gets its official borders in 1923. These are the borders that we're, from this moment on, going to work from. And then, of course, we get the UN partition that then creates internal borders in the hopes of creating a Jewish state, an Arab state, an international zone. Of course, it, the indigenous people there, the Palestinians, they resist this because in order to create a Jewish state, it would mean that they would have to be kicked off their land. And of course, they say no. In 1949, we get the armistice lines, Israel is created, there's no Arab state created, but there's a massive refugee problem where Palestinians that lived in what became Israel, about 700 to 800 of them were kicked out and 
went into the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, into refugee camps, where they continue to live today. <coughs> uh, but this, this ended up becoming the idea of what Israel was going to be. It's not its official borders. Israel has never declared its official borders. But what happens later in 1967 is another war in Israel acquires more territory <coughs> and starts to settle the Sinai Peninsula, Gaza, uh, the West Bank, and Syria's Golan Heights. The Sinai Peninsula is given back to Egypt um, with the Camp David Treaty, which in, in turn what Egypt needed to do is neutralize itself from the Palestinian struggle, just not be a part of it anymore. Notice that the Golan Heights is occupied and is still occupied, but in our mental map today, it's not there. Now it's just a Palestinian-Israel conflict, right? And this is the mental map that we get with that shift with Oslo, in particular, that two-state solution, the idea that there's going to be a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. You have the, in the middle of the, the UN partition and then the, um, the quote-unquote 67 borders, then you get stage four where because there has been so much settlement activity in the West Bank that it has, it has brought the two-state solution into crisis. It's so difficult to carve out a state for Palestine if state, state territorial conceptions are that uh, space needs to be homogenous, exclusive, right, contiguous, this is a big thing. Uh, with clearly defi defined borders. And I'll get back to this set of maps later because I think that um, although it's really useful, it um, leaves out a lot of things and it shapes our idea of what the conflict is and what the solution should be uh, in ways that prevent, I believe, prevent a true self-determining politics to arise. But what I'd like to do is Talk about the prehistory of, the, of these maps. How did we get to these maps? We use them so uncritically and so often. And um, they have a prehistory, and it's a colonial prehistory. So why don't we examine that and see if maybe, maybe this can be useful or important. And so what I want to do is look at, from the 19th century on, how Palestine begins being mapped by European powers that want to colonize it. And so we're going to look at different ways of mapping it. And each one of those maps uh, comes about according to a specific challenge, a specific problem. And by this, I want to just show that maps come into being when societies call for them. They haven't been there with us. They haven't been here with us for all time. They've changed quite a bit. They say a lot about the kind of society that we have. And so from that, I'd like us to then question if this is the kind of society that we have, that, that we would like. Um, so let's look at uh, early 1900s, late, it was like 1798, 99, 1800. Uh, Napoleon goes to war with, with uh, England. And because England's navy is just so mighty and he knows he's going to lose, he decides to turn his warships over to Egypt. And what's important with the Eastern question here is the Ottoman Empire is falling, is, is, de is in decline at this moment. And the question is, once the Ottoman Empire falls, which European powers are going to take over that territory? And how is that going to shift the power balance or imbalance in Europe? And Britain was very, very keen on keeping the status quo because Britain was the, the strongest empire, right? And between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, Russia was making moves down because it needed a warm water port all year round. And so it kept trying to, it wanted to take the Ottoman Empire's land at least at this moment because if it needed to sail, it kept needing to ask permission to the Ottoman Empire if it can go in the straits between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. So you have Russia, then you have France, and Napoleon becomes pretty important in the history of the modern mapping of Palestine. 
Because what he does is he decides to turn his warships to Egypt and he takes his scientists and his artists. The idea is to cut a canal between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea so that he could beat Britain to India and weaken Britain in that sense. And so what he does very famously is he comes out with uh, the description of the encyclopedia right, of Egypt. It's very famous if you've taken an anthropology class. I think that this is kind of central or standard. Um, and even though he loses, when his scientists go back to Paris and they put together this encyclopedia, you get in there the first maps of the area. So this is the collection of sheets, and here's our Palestine, just to orient ourselves this way. Zooming in, even though it's mostly of the Nile area and Egypt, there are several sheets that, are, that become the first on the ground measurements of Palestine. And this is the, the Reza, uh, the Reza uh, sheet. And notice that the mapping is only concerned with the coasts and concerned with um, the topography, right? And this is because Napoleon's uh, military is conducting naval and ground warfare around the coasts. They don't care about inland. This, they didn't measure it. Here is the sheet of Jerusalem in Yaffa, and this sheet is famous, famous for being quite accurate along the coasts and really inaccurate inland. Well, they didn't actually measure inland, but when they got to Paris, they needed, they, want, they knew that the audience they wanted to sell this encyclopedia to was going to want to know about the Holy Land, and Jerusalem is far more inland. And so, as you can see, these mountains, they still look like these caterpillar mountains of medieval maps. Jerusalem is here, um, and Yaffa and the coast are here. So, again, maps come into being when society calls for them, and this is a really great example of why Napoleon, of, of a problem Napoleon is having, and how he was going to help solve it with a map. And this is why it looks the way it does. Moving along through the 19th century, you get a lot of biblical explorers coming to Palestine, um, and many, many of them are um, hoping to prove the Bible true, mostly from the Protestant angle. Um, and they want to use science to do that, and this is famously done through archaeology, and cartography becomes central as well. Um, you get the idea that you can actually take the Bible as a field guide and read it word for word and find out the borders of the Holy Land. And so in the 1870s, the Palestine Exploration Fund out of London, it does this. And it does it with the help of the British War Office because they're really the only ones that have the technology and the capacity to to do such, to create such adequate, uh, um, accurate maps. And of course, it's done under the cover of science, right, and religion, and, and this is really great for Britain because in case it ever needs to go to war to protect the Ottoman Empire again or to actually take over those territories, it will have a map. Notice that uh, this is where, you, if, if you're familiar with the map of Palestine, you can kind of see the shape, yeah? This becomes the first time that Palestine begins to get its borders. It, it doesn't become an official map, but it will inform the idea of what Palestine is in the future, when it starts being carved up after World War I. And notice that it says it's a map of Western Palestine. And it ends at the River Jordan, and this is an interesting story in that um, the Americans heard of this project and they wanted to get in on the mapping, but they weren't very, very good cartographers. And so the British allowed them uh, in order to prevent France or another power from doing it, right? 
And so they told him, okay, you can map, but you take the eastern part of the Jordan River. Because if you read the, 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 the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, they're using the book of Joshua, which is a very geographic book, to delineate like, the tribes of Israel. And they did continue to on the eastern side of the River Jordan. So the Americans were given that side, but largely because there wasn't anything really important there. The, the more important biblical sites were on the western side, and <coughs> the Americans messed it up then. That's, that's kind of all right. And it turned out that the Americans did mess it up, and they didn't complete their map. And so then what we ended up getting was just this map, the map of Western Palestine. But it ends up by, by chance, you know, uh, informing what we think of the borders of the Holy Land are. Zooming in on this map, I wanted just to point out, um, you don't have the Negev Desert uh, according to the book of the, the book of Judges, the borders of the Holy Land go north in uh, Dan, which is Banias, to Beersheba down here. The border you get the Negev later uh, in the early 1900s because Britain wants to create a buffer between. Palestine and the, in the east, and Egypt, which it has now controlled because it wants to protect the Suez Canal, which has been cut. So they end up destroying this line. Here is a, a sheet of this map. It's the Palestine Exploration Fund map. And just zooming in, what you get, here's Bethlehem. What you get is an interest in the holy sites, Church of the Nativities there. Um, right here <clears throat> and but you also get roads and you also get wells and cisterns right you get water points because this is also going to be a military map right? so if you're going to conduct ground warfare you need to know where to camp so you also get the topography so moving on then we we then start getting uh, <clears throat> A, a, a bounded Palestine that resembles the Palestine Exploration Fund map, the very famously with the Sykes-Picot Agreement between France and Britain that was going to carve up the Ottoman Empire as slices of a cake or a pie, right? It's an op each part is an object that can be owned. And this was actually quite <clears throat> the trend at the time. Here's a carving up of Africa by the European powers. Not caring at all who lived there, just carving it up to whatever it was that they conceived uh, was going to be useful to them. This is actually, this goes back even further than the 19th century in that the first time a line exists in a treaty between competing powers, the idea of cutting up the world happens with the Treaty of Tordesillas and the Papal Bulls only a couple of years after the discovery of the Americas because the Portuguese and the French are fighting over it and, and, and the church is very upset that these Catholic powers are fighting. So why don't you, so Spain, why don't you take everything west of this line, this line of uh, longitude, and then Portugal will take the other side, which is why, like, cutting right through the Americas, in Brazil they speak Portuguese and in the rest they speak Spanish, right? It wasn't mapped, but the, uh, what's important is that the idea to actually cut up the world without a care of what was there, it dates back to the colonization of the Americas and then comes back all over the world. Same logic. Moving on to uh, what happens after the British colonized Palestine. They've already mapped it. This Palestine Exploration Fund map is actually used by Allenby to conquer Jerusalem. It becomes, it's the most accurate map of Palestine for, the next, for 50 years until the British uh, colonized Palestine officially. In uh, the 1920s, they start creating 
proper, private property map, so cutting up Palestine even more internally. So looking at the difference of this, remember that this map was uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund map of the 1870s to conduct warfare, but also with an eye on the important religious sites. Once the British take over, they start adding these lines internally. This is a cadastro map, a private property map. <clears throat> 1920s and 1930s. What happens with this is the story goes, and it's, it's totally true, that Zionists in Europe wanted to buy land in Palestine, but they didn't know who to buy it from because a lot of the land was owned in common. It wasn't owned by just one person, so they didn't know who. And they also didn't know precisely the boundaries of whatever land they were going to buy. So they were encouraging the British to implement a cadastro system. And the British had been doing it all over India and all over so many of its other colonies. So, <clears throat> so it, was, it, it was happy to do that also because what it would allow it to do was to implement the idea of uh, the capitalist production of agriculture, understanding that um, it's just not efficient for you to have subsistence agriculture. You know, it's... In that, in that you own the land as a village, that doesn't make any sense. Why don't we get you and your personal interest, if you own one piece of land, you're going to want to make a lot of money by producing a lot of agriculture, and then it will allow Britain to tax that and make money for itself, right? So it starts introducing this idea. And this is actually a really great example of not really caring about how people understood space yeah. and implementing a new idea of space. Uh, in that paper in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism called When the Carob Tree Was the Border, it specifically talks about this project. And uh, I wondered, so how did people understand the borders between their neighbors, them and their neighbors, before the map? And you get so many stories in Palestine still of people saying, well, it was that carob tree to that carob tree. And mm -hmm. that, we're not used to that, no? Um, but paying attention to that more closely, what you have there is a social relation that we're not used to. We have a social relation of neighbors actually talking to each other and figuring out their problems, right? And whether there were disputes or not, they actually, the decisions were theirs, right? And they had to live with the consequences of whatever decision they made. And so they didn't need this line, right? Because they had already negotiated, it's that tree to that tree. And they also didn't need maps because they knew their land. They saw it every day, right? The reason why you get so many maps of Palestine in the 19th century from the West is because they didn't know Palestine. They needed to communicate it to outside forces. So, so then what happens with the private property map is that Britain thinks that this is just completely backwards. Right? And what it wants to do is create precise borders and uh, title land to individuals rather than communities and then have a centralized database that the British mandate controls so that if there's ever like a border dispute, you go ask them. So basically what they did is create a job that was not necessary to make themselves necessary. This is colonialism, right? convincing us that we need them, right? And so then what happens is that that social relation of negotiation is destroyed. And now there's a mediator. And now we become totally convinced after generations that we don't have the capacity to exercise political power with, amongst each other, that we need somebody to decide for us. What was interesting about the the Cadastro project is that the, when, when the British left, they were able to settle a title to land and make these maps in this part of Palestine. If you've seen the UN partition that comes that same, at that same moment, it looks quite similar, right? Where the black is given to Jews Right, and then the light gray is supposed to remain Palestinian. And of course, the negative is given to the proposed Jewish state with the idea that more Jews will immigrate 
What's interesting here is that why were the British only able to finish this part? If you look at the Peel Commission report on the revolts of, the, of 1936 to 39, the peasants started to understand what the, the land settlement project was doing, that it was allowing them to be dispossessed much more easily. And so what they started to do was break the cartographer's instruments and block roads so that they wouldn't be able to make maps, so that they could not map the land. Now these are illiterate peasants who we often understand as backward and we, we, we do not take seriously as smart people. But they understood exactly what was happening and the British were afraid of them. It's all over the Peel Commission report. And they were, it largely, you saw a lot of the resistance here and what was later to become the West Bank. After uh, Palestinians are kicked off their land and become refugees in 1948, you start seeing the map, even though it was a colonial idea, being appropriated by them to rally for uh, anti-colonial struggle for liberation struggle and this was actually quite common all over the world where although it was the colonists that carved up the map that people themselves started to use that as a rallying point what's interesting this is a plo poster from 1964 for the sake of our land you see the map but the map is in the background what's in the foreground is armed struggle then you also have women and children so uh, uh, pointing to popular struggle as well as armed struggle you get in the uh, Farty logos by the top, and then uh, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine down below, also using the map with Fatah um, having it in the background as well with armed struggle. In the foreground, the Popular Front having the map, but always with uh, the return of the refugees into it. <coughs> we have famously Yasser Arafat with his kafiya in the shape of a map of Palestine. <coughs> In the 1980s, uh, I came across this map uh, while I was doing field work um, from Khalil Tufatchi, who does a lot of Jerusalem mapping. Uh, he had created the, he, which he calls the first survey of Palestine by Palestinians in 1983, which was then published in 1988. And it was a team of about five Palestinians that went throughout the entire country <coughs> and survey where there were existing Palestinian villages abandoned. And notice that in the key, all of the Jewish areas, they refer to as settlements, meaning that they're still understanding this as a colonization project, right? Mm -hmm. That included Tel Aviv. Everything. Everything okay. that was settled by Jews um, uh, or is understood as settlement. And you notice that you can't really see the d dividing West Bank as a, they're there, but they're not very prominent, right? So it's still an understanding of Palestine as one, and also as under colonialism. In 1988, it's published, and it's also the same year where, when the, the PLO decides on the two-state project, very famously. So I asked um, Khalid Tufaji, well, how did your mapping change after that? And he said, well, we weren't really allowed to map Israel, so now we just map the West Bank and Gaza, because now it's all about the negotiations. Now the map is about the negotiations, meaning that they're for the political class and not for and by the people. So this is our mental map of, of uh, the conflict and its potential solution where Palestinians will get a state in the West Bank and Gaza. And back to this map, uh, which we use quite a bit, we see how there's a crisis in the two-state solution because of the settlement project that is making a two-state solution difficult to map. This map, um, again, does not have the Golan Heights, right? It also does not have the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, it also doesn't have labeled uh, neighboring countries. So it's as, it's as if this conflict is really taking place in a vacuum, right? where it really is just this strip of land. <coughs> 
very difficult for us to understand this in a global context, in a regional context, even in an internal context. It's very much from the perspective of the Palestinian political class. Because the green is the land that they're allowed to have some sort of control over, right? It's not the land where there's actual Palestinians. You don't have the refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, right? There's, if you look at the minutes of the negotiations, um, you actually get the political, the Palestinian political leadership saying things like to the Israelis, give me the border, it will solve everything. Jerusalem settlements water. They don't talk about the refugees. And they, of course they don't talk about the 48 Palestinians, the ones inside Israel. So it's become such a fetish of the map that it's making actually negotiations so difficult because the map can't solve everything. I'll give you an example of why. This is just a random map of the area. And looking at Jerusalem, um, there and Ramallah, Bethlehem, and uh, Tel Aviv, Tul Karam, these places are important to this map because they're large cities, <coughs> or they're just important. Um, Except that what's pretty difficult in, with the question of Jerusalem is, is Jerusalem really just as important as Tel Aviv and Tul Karam and Ramallah especially, right? Uh, definitely to the people that live there, uh, the, all of those places are equally important. But in the negotiations, Jerusalem cannot be discussed by the Israelis because it's too important even though the Palestinian leadership wants to discuss it, in addition to everything else. It's too important, but the Israeli side will say, but it's only 0.04% of the West Bank. Right? So it's too important, but it's, it's insignificant. So they're, they're trying to do two things at once. They're trying to use Cartesian space, which is, in theory, every single place on on the map is equal in value. But at the same time, they're using sacred space where Jerusalem is the most important place in the world, no? This is a, or an early medieval map, or an early modern map of the world. Jerusalem is in the middle and the three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, are connected to it. You can tell it's early modern because the Americas are over in the corner. They don't really know what to do with it. The Bible never talked about it, so we're just going to put it there. But they're trying to do, they're trying to combine sacred geography with Cartesian geography, and they're coming against this clash. This is a German map. German or Dutch, I'm sorry, I can't. It's German. It's German? I know. Um, getting back to um, the negotiations in our mental map, the Palestinian leadership is only allowed to map the West Bank and Gaza. Um, the, in 2006, when Google Earth came out, there was a Palestinian refugee who decided he was going to map all of the villages that were destroyed or depopulated in the Nakba, 1948. And um, because, and he was not a cartographer, he was not a politician, he was a medical doctor. And because he was so active online in the Google Earth community, and he introduced it to the Google Earth community, um, people were fascinated by it. The way that Google work, Earth works is that it gives you the satellite imagery, and then you can create layers on top of it with little pins, and then if you click on a pin, you can get pictures and audio and all kinds of description. And so every one of those pins, those red pins, is a depopulated or destroyed village from the Nakba. And this layer went viral, as viral as Google Earth layers can go, because um, people just found it really interesting. And when Google Earth first came out, it had an algorithm for interestingness so that any any layer that was getting downloaded a lot would automatically go into the best of the Google Earth community on everybody's Google Earth software. Which meant that 
a lot of Zionists got it on the Google Earth software. <laughs> and they were not happy. And it started a, a, a battle online. Um, and there is an Israeli settlement near Haifa there that saw that it had a pin on it. Um, and it was contesting that it had been created on top of a destroyed village. So it calls the Israeli police. And it says, we want to sue Google Earth. And of course, the police don't really have any jurisdiction on that. But it ended up creating this big battle that it got so much attention. Um, but a major reason why it got so much attention is because it was so distinct from the maps that we're used to Palestinians coming out with uh, since Oslo that are completely policed and are not allowed to talk about the, uh, the initial violence, the violence that established the State of Israel. But the refugees' maps that always talk about the Nakba, right? They don't take orders, they're not policed, and they're made by people who are not even professional. Um, also in the camps, you see these kinds of maps, graffiti of all of Palestine, and these maps have zero authority on the ground. Zero. They're graffiti. But they're terrifying to the Zionist movement because it, it clearly shows that people still remember, they haven't forgotten, and it, they really, they still have that will to return. Uh, I'll finish up with um, a map that I hope will bring the view down back to the ground to people. It's a, it's a map that I helped, that I created with, uh, in Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem, uh, with Palestinians from the camp. Um, this is what it looks like, but just to orient you a bit, we got an aerial photograph of the camp, and they asked me to help map it. And we had major conversations about security issues. I didn't want to map, but they asked me to. And so we had to have conversations about the dangers of mapping, and they said, well, Israel has all of the maps. When they come and arrest us, they show us on their GPS, our family names on top of our buildings. They, they already have the maps. We don't have maps. And they needed a map to help do a, a water project of, of uh, sewers and water, water problems in the camp. And so I helped with that. Um, and so what I did as a professional cartographer, I got this aerial photograph, which by the way, only Israel was able to, an Israeli uh, private company sells because Palestinians are not allowed to. They have zero jurisdiction in the air. Uh, but I ended up getting it in a roundabout way. Um, no doubt this is something like the aerial photograph that Israel has used to map the camp. But I was tracing it in mapping software. And just to orient you, um, this is the wall. Here it is a little bit down below. So Jerusalem is this way, Bethlehem is this way. And this is an olive orchard that the camp used to use until the wall blocked them from it. And here it is again, and you notice that it snakes. Here's Rachel's tomb. And then uh, it allows tourists from Israel to come in without having to see any Palestinians. And then these are parking lots that people's, people's land was taken and, and raised in order to create parking lots for the buses. So I traced, I traced this from above, someone who does not know the camp very well. Um, and it was really difficult because the camp, of course, is no longer tents. It's, buildings and they're very cramped and they're very makeshift and so I was asking uh, one of my um, collaborators on this, Nidal Al-Azra, if he could check my work. Like, did I do the buildings okay? Are the streets okay? And as he was looking at the map, he looked at the streets and he said, this, your streets are good but you know the rooftops are also streets. So here are my streets. And what, what Nidal means by the rooftops are also streets is when we're under curfew and the Israeli military blocks the streets, we can't use those streets, so we make our own streets. Mm -hmm. And so here's him having made his own streets. And I like to position his map against my map because I'm the professional and I can never make this map. No. And the way that we're taught is that the professionals know everything and that the people don't know anything. 
And so we're going to tell them what to do. Can you imagine if I tell Nizam, no, these are the streets. These are the only streets you can use. He would be dead, he'd be in prison, he'd be shot. He creates his own streets. All this to point out, people exercise power all of the time. They create space all of the time. Space is not created only by the professionals, right? And so it's a plea to us if we're seriously interested in the question of self-determination, that we start looking at the exercises of power of everyday people and taking them seriously, rather than having this relationship that continues that colonial logic that there is only a small group from above that's going to tell everybody how to live. So I'll end it there. Thanks, Linda. That was excellent. Um, well, I'm sure we'll have plenty of points for discussion, questions, and so on. Would anyone like to stop? I think Brink was first in there. Yes. Be happy to let you. Um, thank you very much. Um, very interesting. I, I'd like to comment uh, on the subject of um, the, the thing you were, the profile you gave us is of sort of Western views of this land and views through Western cartography and of other kinds of things down to even mapping property relations, as you call them, internal um, borders. And I would just like to comment that there was a, another system of mapping and another system of property that had to do with the Ottoman Empire. And, and so that um, the notion that the British were the initiators of this move towards private property um, is probably not the case in the sense, first of all, there were, it was Islamic private property that went back for many centuries, in not only in cities, but in around cities, and, and um, then also other kinds of Ottoman property further out in the country, which is not exactly Islamic in terms of its nature, but was there for centuries. And then um, the British also did some um, cadastral, I mean, stuff, but, but the Ottomans had done it as well. And so that you find prior to the British uh, an entire regime of private property um, essentially being developed out of what had been more, more state-owned land and things like that. And so you get um, very elaborate documentation regimes, you get, you get boundaries set up in for, for these new kinds of uh, entitled uh, uh, institutions. From 1858 in the Ottoman Empire you have title institutions which convert what had been state land into private held land and transferable land. So I just would just say that there is um, another genealogy of mapping both at the, um, the, the, the boundaries of the, the wilaya uh, uh, or the, uh, the province or the qada of, of the various parts of that were all sort of subdivided and, and mapped I'm sure. And, but certainly they were um, the, the property lines, these internal borders as you call them, interesting I think it's right. Um, that the British, in, in fact, built on that pre-existing system. And, and a lot of what you see in terms of what the British were able to carry out in the mandate has, has Ottoman roots. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's quite true. The Ottomans did uh, create some cadastral maps, but they weren't quite generalized. The ones that I'm interested in um, are... The moment that I'm interested in is the moment when and also, I don't want to say that the British are the ones that introduced private property right. relations. And if I said that, then I misspoke. What I do want to say is that when the Ottomans, after the land code, implemented titling, they weren't interested in mapping very much. They were interested more in who held the right to the land. So they, much of this was not accompanied by actual maps. And so when we get to, for example, the Masha, the commons, what we have there is people in a community holding rights to work the land. But the way that the land was partitioned, it was never frozen or permanent. It was always changed every several years, right? So what wasn't important to them was the specific border for all time, which is what the British were trying to implement, right? Because what was negotiated, because that was always renegotiated and renegotiated. So, and I'm, so, so for me, what I'm interested in is like the negotiation of the border, how then that changes, right? And when I talk about the Peel Commission's report, 
they were specifically talking about the Nusha as being the greatest obstacle to the land settlement claim. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'd like to thank Dahlia for organizing this and arranging everything. <laughs> And uh, thanks to Linda again for coming from Brown. Thank you. And thank you, Brian. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.